begin today by acknowledging the Aboriginal community as the traditional and original owners of Lutruweta and future custodians of the land on which we meet today here in Nipaluna. This was and always will be Aboriginal land. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, the term country means more than merely a place on a map. It's a word used to express the sum total of the values, resources, places, stories and culture that are associated with that area. As among the oldest living cultures in human history, I honour the unique spiritual connection to land, waters and sea. Understanding and respect for community develops an enriched appreciation of our cultural heritage. It is fundamental for us to grow and mature our identity as a nation. We reside in the imagination of country, the spirituality of nature, its simplicity and its complexity. It is this connection that grounds and ties to ancestral land. I acknowledge the past, I live in the present, but it's our future that presents itself as infinite and limitless. This is my acknowledgement of country. My country, your country, and our country. Thank you so much, Kerry, for that um, acknowledgement of country, and it's really great to hear about your own connection uh, to this land that we're lucky enough to call home. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and acknowledge that this land was never ceded. So, um, good afternoon and welcome. It's so great to see so many people here today to celebrate the Community Voices Program. And I've, there are some new people that are here that I haven't met today, so, so for those of you that I don't know, my name is Adrienne Picconi and I'm the CEO of TASCOS. So before we hand over to, to Lucy and to Kerry and to the panel, I'd just like to acknowledge some, some people in attendance today. Uh, the Honourable Sarah Lovell, MLC, David O'Byrne, MP, the Honourable Meg Webb, MLC, uh, Cassie O'Connor is also joining us um, on the screen. And I'd like to welcome all of our Community Voice partners that are here with us this afternoon. Our event sponsors, Aurora and TAS Networks, TASCOS board members, uh, Kathy Brown and Anne Hughes, and our TASCOS members and supporters. Thank you so much for coming along today to join us. I think that the value and the critical need of those with lived experience to be heard and for lived experience perspectives to inform policy and services has been acknowledged by all of us with increasing urgency over the last few years. The lived experience workforce is growing. It's part of the community services industry and it recognises the important value of incorporating the lived experience voice into all of our work, as well as ensuring that all of our services are fit for purpose and reflective of the needs and the expectations of our diverse communities. 
A key focus for TASCOS has been our work in recognising the lived experience of poverty and inequality. And the Community Voices program came about in recognition of the simple fact that those who live it know it best. And too long, their voices have been left out of decision making. Too often we see systems and services fail because they have not consulted with the people who are intended to benefit from the program or to those who are actually using it. We cannot effectively support the Tasmanian community in the absence of their knowledge, their expertise, their values and their needs. And this is where the Community Voice partners come in, with each partner trained, mentored, supported and importantly paid to do this work. Across the team at TASCOS, we've seen firsthand the value of working with Community Voice partners, with their insights and experiences adding valuable, invaluable weight to our, our, our advocacy. For example, Jeff played a key role in the launch of our recent Fair Funding campaign by providing personal insight into the vital services provided by community services and the potential outcome if those services are not able to operate in the future. Mel has worked with TASCOS to highlight the intersection between the cost of living crisis and the housing crisis, giving a powerful radio on ABC to advocate for urgent solutions to both pressing issues. And Mel also co-facilitated a session with me with, uh, with some lived experience advocates as part of the Women's Economic Equality Task Force to help inform this most recent federal budget. Late last year, as part of Anti-Poverty Week, I also worked with uh, Kerry and her lived experience was critical to helping us communicate the reality of living on a low income. In developing the Community Voice Program, we follow in the footsteps of, of and have been privileged to learn from other organisations and advocacy movements who have been doing this work for a long time in our industry, both in Tasmania, but also nationally and internationally. The Community Voices Program was co-designed in a cross-section collaboration funded by TAS Networks, Aurora Energy and Hydro Tasmania, and in partnership with ATDC, Catholic Care, Tagara Lea and four community members. So thank you so much to those individuals and organisations who have invested their time and efforts into co-designing and delivering this program. I'd also like to acknowledge that this program simply wouldn't exist or be what it is today without the passion, skills and courage of the eight Community Voice Partners who are all in the room today. I'd encourage everyone after the panel session to take the time to chat to our Community Voice Partners and to learn more about the program and how you might be able to incorporate their expertise in the work you do. And I know Lucy will be more than happy to answer questions as, as well. On that note, I'd now like to introduce you to TASCOS's Lived Experience Program Coordinator, Dr Lucy Mercer-Mapstone, and congratulate her on the outstanding work in establishing and supporting this program. This was a challenging project both to design and deliver, and Lucy brought a considerable amount of insight, compassion and skill in guiding its develop development from concept to reality. Congratulations and thank you, Lucy. <coughs> Hand over to you. Thanks, Adrian. <laughs> I'm going to do a swift handball and go over to Kerry. <laughs> um, for those who don't know me, my name's Kerry Dare and I am one of the eight TASCOS Community Voice Partners. It was two years ago that I met Lucy, Charlie and the team after applying to join the pilot project to co-design the program. I'd had a 12-month introduction to consumer representation as a lived experience advocate with the Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drugs Council using my history of drug dependence and overdose to advocate for change. As many of you will know, the Community Voices Program is a lived experience advocacy program for people who live on low incomes to have a voice in the services, systems and decisions which affect us and our communities. My community and I are often silenced, stigmatised or discriminated against within Tasmania's deeply entrenched class systems because we live on low incomes. Until now, there's been no dedicated place for people on low incomes to have a collective voice to address this bias. The Community Voices Program fills that critical gap and recognises that perspectives developed 
through living on inadequate incomes are indeed a form of valuable and necessary expertise. The timing of this launch in the midst of a cost of living crisis can't be ignored. It's certainly the topic on everyone's lips. It's therefore timely to consider how people who live on low incomes can add value and make change to the very systems that are fighting us. The Tasmanian community now have access to a previously untapped resource in Community Voice Partners. Organisations can now hear direct feedback on their programs from the perspectives of the actual people who use them. We live in poverty daily. There is no respite. It is our lives 24-7. Because of this, we have a keen eye for spotting sticky issues and recognising nuance that are often missed by services, resources, decisions and policies. Our inputs aim to build empathy and compassion, as well as offering new insights, ideas and solutions. The program is a bright shining example of what happens when the voices of diverse lived experience are included ethically from early inception through to the eventual delivery and evaluation. For me, it feels like the culmination of my life's experiences have been realised in the Community Voices Program. During my time as a partner, the expertise I bring has never been viewed as one dimensional or only being about a singular element of my lived experience. I've never felt pigeonholed as a drug addict or as a sex worker or as a rape survivor or as a person with a disability. This program sees and celebrates my full identity and more importantly, helping to educate others to do the same. To only concentrate on one element of my lived experience puts focus on an isolated and partial picture of who I am and what I have to offer. Additionally, it's a picture often distorted by bias, much of it unconscious. The aspects that make me who I am inform each other. They overlap to create a more complex experience of marginalisation. It's been liberating to gain a deeper understanding of how power and privilege feed into the systems that oppress us. That knowledge gives me back power by helping to turn my own vulnerabilities into actions that have purpose and impact for me, for my community, and for the organisations who support us. Up to you, Lucy. Thanks so much, Kerry, and thank you all for turning up today, both in person and online over there. Um, and a special thanks to TAS Networks and to Aurora Energy, who are sponsoring the event. So I started writing these speaking notes talking about how the program works and the outcomes we've achieved, but the panel will let you hear that firsthand. So I wanted to start off talking a bit more about the ethos behind the program and its design. I know it can be a bit naff to use quotes, and I did ask Kerry if I was being too corny, but I'm going to do it anyway because there's lots of people who have said things better than I ever could in the past. One of my favourite writers, Paolo Freire, wrote, Attempting to liberate the oppressed without their reflective participation in the act of liberation is to treat them as objects that must be saved from a burning building. And as someone a bit more contemporary, Grace Tame, recently said, history, lived experience, the whole truth, unedited, unsanitized, is our greatest learning resource. It is what informs social and structural change. And it's this notion of moving away from paternalistic approaches of speaking on behalf of or filtering what those with lived experience of oppression have to say that forms the foundation for this program and for the many people who have walked before us. It's embodying the idea from the disability rights movement of nothing about us without us. We can't address the root causes of discrimination without those who experience discrimination firsthand. One of the things that's been most important in working towards this ideal is that we take an intersectional approach to understanding lived experience of living on low income. As Kerry described just now, this means we centre a person's whole lived experience of navigating a world where different systems of power and privilege don't happen in silos. 
Yes, all of our community voice partners live on low incomes and in a cost of living crisis, those experiences are urgently relevant. But community voice partners also live with disability and mental, mental and physical health issues, come from multicultural and Aboriginal backgrounds, live in regional and remote areas, belong to the LGBTQIA plus community, are younger, older, veterans, women and single mothers. They have experiences of sex work, drug and alcohol dependence, migration, racism, the justice system, family and domestic violence, and homelessness and housing stress. These are the experiences that drive and are driven by poverty. These are the experiences that make our partners who they are. These are the experiences that make engagements with our partners rich places for learning, humility, and compassion. These are the experiences that are critical to finding innovative collaborative solutions that alleviate poverty. On the flip side, part of the program is also about capability development and learning the organisations who engage with us, developing the skills and mindsets for authentic lived experience and contributing to driving cultural change in our sector. In addition to skill building for organisations, this work also engenders a culture shift. I've found that working with lived experience experts pushes us to consider what it means to be human in professional environments. As staff, do we check our identities at the office door? In working with our partners, I've begun to feel inauthentic doing that. To leave the sharing of vulnerability to them feels unequal. Having them in the room makes space for more humanity. As a queer, disabled woman, this feels liberating for me. I finally feel like I can bring my whole self to work and be proud of that. And the work is better for it. And it's not just me. I see the organisational staff, some of whom are on my left here, who engage with the partners doing the same thing. Bringing more of themselves personally to the engagements, making the relationships, the process, the outcomes and our culture deeper and richer. So let's hear from some of those people themselves. So the panel today is designed to give you all some insight into the program from the perspective of the people who do the advocacy and the people who work with our advocates. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome our panellists. We've got Helen Montgomery, who is a Policy and Research Analyst at State Government Department of Premier and Cabinet, Dr Charlie Burton, Policy Manager at TASCOS, and Jordan Abel, a Senior Corporate Affairs and Stakeholder Engagement Advisor for, <laughs> for Aurora Energy. And on my right, I've got Jara, Jeff and Mel, who came on as Community Voice Partners in about August last year. My co-facilitator, Kerry, and I will ask some questions of our panellists, and then there'll be time for Q&A from you at the end. So, over to you, Kerry. Community members on low incomes might want to get involved in the program. It takes a thorough and supported approach to supporting us to undertake systemic advocacy with organisations and government. Jara, why did becoming a community voice partner look like for you? Why did you get involved? And what training, support and payment do you get through the program? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, unbelievable, not hard to believe these days, but saw an ad for Facebook. <laughs> wow, that sounds like something I could do. I'm unemployed, living in the little community of Waratah, up in the northwest, and thought that I could be their voice. And with the remarkable, <laughs> it was a, a week worth of training that we were put through, uh, last year, I think September, August, September last year. Uh, <laughs> wow, uh, I've just done a day's uni course down in Queenstown, effective communication. I could have taught it from what I learned from <laughs> these guys much better than they did. Um, it was... No offence, sorry, you Taz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry for any, anyone from Taz. Um, but yeah, these guys training program was just incredible. Um, gentle, respectful, compassionate, and above all, it, it came from here. What 
has costs are doing with the Community Voices Program isn't driven by corporates. It's not driven by anything but a need for this to be heard. The rest of the world. From people who don't normally have a voice. And I feel incredibly proud and honoured to be part of the CVP because it allows my community to have a say in what goes on. And we already have done so with the, um, the literacy program, the literacy focus groups that we undertook um, for the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, that's just a remarkable process that uh, was short, sharp and wonderful. The results are out and being used. Our voices were heard by the government and have already been put into practice. Um, and to finish up, luckily, we get paid to do this. Um, it doesn't happen often. It's not something that uh, is going to allow me to go and buy a yacht tomorrow. Um, but Think about getting involved with it. Do. That's <laughs> as simple as it gets. Thanks so much, Jara. conducting community consultations, service reviews, preventing at events, conferences and sitting on panels, engaging in governance, governance, doing radio, TV and print interviews, delivering professional development workshops and co-creating organisational strategy. Jordan, what does the engagement process look like from an organisational perspective? For example, what engagements has Aurora done and what have you learned from the process? Um, I don't think this is working. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, Lucy. Um, I think we're working yep. now. I'd just like to first of all say um, that I'm really proud uh, to be here today um, to chat to you all about something that I'm really passionate about um, and to say thanks to Tascos and especially to you, Lucy, um, for the opportunity. I started a secondment um, at Aurora um, in January last year um, and a couple of weeks into that role I got an email from a lady named Lucy, um, asking me if I wanted to be involved in TASCollab. I had no idea at that time what TASCollab was, but the further I read on through the email, um, the more excited I got by the, by the opportunity to, to be involved um, with something that was very unique, um, but also something that was very community focused. Um, supporting each other is an integral part um, of what it means to be Tasmanian, um, and it's certainly something that I'm uh, proud to be part of the community for as well. Um, so fast forward nine months from when I took on that secondment role um, and Aurora was in the midst of uh, reviewing its yes policy um, and the internal practices that helped deliver the program um, to determine essentially whether the model was still fit for purpose. Um, as part of that review, um, the business decided to engage the Community um, Voices program to inform um, where there may be gaps um, in the model from people's own per personal experiences. And for folks who don't know, what's the YES program? Uh, the YES program is a, a nation-leading um, hardship program that um, we're very proud of um, at Aurora um, that's supported close to 15,000 people um, since it uh, started about eight years ago. Um, I think having that uh, lived experience lens um, as part of the, the broader review um, gave the business the, the confidence that the policy would uh, continue to help the, the very people um, it was designed to support um, initially. Um, the three community partners we engaged um, as, as part of that process um, gave some really candid assessments um, of their dealings with Aurora and other ser service providers uh, around uh, Tasmania. Um, and the biggest takeaway from me um, was that the really open and honest and frank conversations um, uh, enabled some really unfiltered feedback straight from the customer uh, to us 
which in return was um, made us or enabled us to, to gain a much greater understanding of the potential short, shortfalls of the policy, um, as well as reaffirm a few things that we thought we were doing okay and already. So um, that was the, the first engagement. Um, a more recent one of the community, uh, of the, a more recent engagement, sorry, of the Community Voices Program um, saw um, our, our yes team participate in a workshop um, to unpack vulnerability through lived experience. Um, every single day of the year, our YES team um, deal with Tasmanians who unfortunately need a little hand to get back on top um, of their energy bills. What I can say about the 90 minute workshop that um, I was lucky enough to sit in on um, that was facilitated by Lucy was uh, that it was such a powerful experience. I walked away um, thinking that the, the stories shared by the partners were, were really moving. Um, and um, I guess that enabled the, the YES team um, to then gain uh, from the workshop, you know, um, then empower them, sorry, to better under, appreciate um, and better respond to customers um, in vulnerable circumstances, knowing that vulnerability is not just about potentially how much money you've got in the bank. Um, vulnerability is, is much broader than that um, and can come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, I just want to leave you with two things. Um, I encourage anyone in the room or online who's um, thinking about gauge, engaging with the program to absolutely do that. You won't regret it. Um, we've engaged with the program three times now. Um, we've got some really invaluable insights um, that we've been able to feed back into the business um, to enable us to grow as a business um, and to become more inclusive. Um, and this last one's a little cheeky. I thought there might be more politicians in the room, but. Um, if there's anyone in the crowd with deep pockets, please think about um, funding the program. The program has nowhere near reached its full potential um, and it's vitally important that Tasmanians on low incomes continue to have a platform for which their voices are heard. Thank you. Thanks so much. Program thus far, eight of us partners have individually conducted over 90 engagements. Part of making sure these engagements are effective and safe, the program includes evaluation and enhancement. In providing reflective feedback, community voice partners have put a staple right where I need to read, but <laughs> no, really, that was Lucy. <laughs> um, they've agreed that across 100% of those engagements that they felt heard, respected, could authentically contribute to creating positive change, and that they develop new skills. So this one's for Jeff. What do organisations need to know to work with community voice partners effectively and authentically? What have organisations done to make you feel heard and respected? Um, I think for anyone wishing to engage with, with lived experience advocates, I think we just want to be treated like anybody else. We're not fragile little snowflakes, you know. Yes, a lot of us have been through adversity, trauma, all sorts of things that are associated with living in low socioeconomic situations where, you know, we're overrepresented by mental health issues and, and addictions and self-medicating and trauma and intergenerational poverty and family violence, you name it. So yes, we've been through a fair bit, some of us, um, but I think we draw strength from our passion because I, I think it's a very human thing that once you, once you overcome adversity and you come through the other side and you're feeling a bit stronger, you just feel compelled to want to help others in that situation and you want to help those who are out there still struggling. Um, and um, <laughs> A bit lost. I'm a bit nervous. Sorry. Um, I think um, something I've experienced in some of my engagements is that people are a little bit frightened to handle us. They think we're a little bit because I mean you, you'll get a sheet with uh, you know a, a, what is it an engagement needs and expectations. So each of us individually will outline what we may or may not be willing to speak about, what our what we might need to do if we're feeling a bit triggered and whatnot, and task costs really do put in the uh, trauma-informed supports for us as well. So we're not fragile, we, um, we can be, but we're not overly sensitive because we're here, we're feeling strong, we're drawing strength from our passion to help other people. And 
over the last few years, I've, I've been engaged in um, peer support work in the alcohol and other drug sector services um, and lived experience advocacy with the Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Council and now for about a year with uh, TASCOS. Um, the thing I think I'd like you to know is that it, it really does work. It really is effective engaging with lived experience advocates because when you're in a room, you, you're, um, you're listening to someone's story and, and you can't help but be viscerally, emotionally affected by that. And so rather than taking a, a professional kind of intellectual approach to forming policy and making decisions on our behalf, once you listen to us, it really can open up your hearts and minds um, to, to, to really help inform those decisions so that we get bang for our buck and our services are, are really well informed and they can really help us at, you know, on ground level. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, when Jeff and I were talking about, you know, what he was going to say, that human connection was something that we really spoke about in terms of when I talk about changing the nature of professional and what that looks like, um, I think this creates a real conduit for connection between communities and professional environments in a way that is really personal and creates space for those vulnerabilities. So Charlie, um, 13 different organisations have engaged with the program so far. A number of them have done repeat engagements, like Aurora and Deepak here, um, and that includes TASCOS. We talk a lot about organisational readiness when it comes to engaging with lived experience. What did it take for TASCOS to become ready? And what does that journey like for you as someone who's been with us from the start almost three years ago? Networking now. Um, I guess the first thing is that no organisation, well, very few organisations will probably be truly ready uh, because working with a lived experience program or lived experience advocates does require a different way of working and, and it requires practice. So um, don't worry if you're not ready and, um, and listen up because I've got some tips. <laughs> Uh, from my experience, there are some things that it would be helpful for people considering this kind of engagement to think about. And I'll just touch on my experience over these three years and then wrap up with, with some three tips, if you like. I had the privilege of coming in uh, at Ground Zero, I guess, uh, right from the beginning when we were doing the co-design process. So um, with amazing people on, on the stage here today and the rest of you in the audience. Um, and it really was a privilege. Um, we, that design or co-design process had a number of stages. We spent some time foundation building, working out how we were going to work together. Then we started talking about defining the problem that we'd work on, went through a pilot phase, and then, of course, here we are today at the official launch. You make it sound so simple, Charlie. <laughs> I've got more grey hair. I don't know what I'm <laughs> no. Um, of all the stages in the design process, it was the foundation building that, for me, was the most powerful and remains the most important. I think as I talk, um, I'll be echoing many of the sentiments that others on the stage have, have expressed, and we didn't swap notes. <laughs> Lucy facilitated the foundation building process so skillfully and so authentically and ethically um, she helped us to identify the assumptions and the biases or unconscious biases that we all brought into the room with us. For example, we learned quickly that we've been making assumptions around how easy or not it would be for people to participate. Does someone have a car? Can they afford to pay for petrol? Can they afford a bus ride? Uh, do they need help to pay for childcare in order to attend one of our meetings? Is the physical space of the meeting room um, suitably accessible? Uh, and can everyone afford the data or even do they have an internet connection in order to attend online meetings? We also heard about some of the biases people experience when it comes to being heard. They might be a person of colour, an older person, a younger person, a woman, a person with a disability, a person from the LGBTQI. I should quick just community. say that because yeah. I'm in the queer community myself. <laughs> I still can't say the words. 
anyway, so understanding some of those biases and as Jeff um, mentioned, some of the ways that uh, we can support people to more clearly have their voices heard. So through that foundation building phase, I want to share three things with you that I, that I learned and that might help you and your organisation um, to become more ready to engage with lived experience advocates. The first thing is that we're all experts in some way, and it might be by virtue of our content knowledge, or it might be by virtue of our experiential knowledge at living as our unique selves. Some people refer to this second kind of knowledge as being experts in our own lives. Second, when you might just want to dive in and start producing outcomes, because that's what we're all here for, we want to see change, it might be tempting to um, shortcut the what might feel a time-consuming and unnecessary process of that foundation building, unquestioning our assumptions and unconscious biases. But it's probably the most powerful part of the program. Um, coming to understand that you don't, you're not a bad person if you have those assumptions or biases. We all bring these simply by virtue of being who we are with our life experiences. Every door we walk through, every street we walk down, every conversation we have, we bring that with us. And, uh, and the challenge is to start questioning those assumptions. So the final takeaway for me, I guess, and it's a bit of an invitation for everyone here, is that the distinction between our work personas and so-called lived experience is possibly not as distinct as we might think. As Lucy alluded to, um, every day I walk in, in, into work, I'm, I'm feeling more empowered and more able to bring my whole self, partly as a result of the work that we have all done together. So if you're nervous about the idea of engaging a lived experience program or lived experience advocates, please don't be. Um, it's an amazing, rich and valuable opportunity and through a structured program and a supported program such as our Community Voice Partners program, um, you've got the support you need to make the change that you want to. Thanks, Charlie. the organisations who have engaged with the program told us that 83% agreed that engaging with the program contributed to reducing organisational service expenditure, so cost savings, and 100% agreed that the process was effective, they felt supported, that they would recommend it to colleagues, and that the engagements contributed to improved outcomes using their services. On the topic of outcomes, Helen, can you tell us how um, DPAC, Department of Premier and Cabinet, engaged with the program, what did that engagement involve and what were the outcomes? Thank you, Lucy. Um, my team at Department of Premier and Cabinet worked as the Secretariat for the Literacy Advisory Panel. During this time, we engaged the Community Voice Partners twice as we worked to deliver the Premier with recommendations and the framework to live literacy in Tasmania. The first engagement we had with the Community Voice Partners was for them to speak with people with lived experience of low literacy to inform the panel's final consultation report at the end of 2022. The outcomes of this engagement was that we and the panel were able to more fully understand the true impacts of the stigma experienced by people living with low literacy and the way that low literacy impacts a person's life well beyond reading and writing. We heard this through the difficulties that the partners experienced in recruiting participants willing to identify themselves as having low literacy and through the experience the experiences that were bravely shared by the participants that were interviewed, either in one-on-one -on -one or focus group settings. During this consultation, we heard from people that would not normally have been reached through traditional consultation methods, either because of their literacy barriers or because they said they felt the government did not care what they had to say. These interviews were incorporated into the final consultation report along with other inputs such as academic research, previous community consultation and panel member expertise. The second engagement with the partners involved them presenting an abridged version of that report to the same cohort of participants to give them an opportunity to provide a final round of feedback on how their, or how their contributions have been represented. The feedback we got from the partners on how that process was run was that participants felt heard by that consultation. I think as well, like it, we can't underestimate the power of 
um, Helen asking them to go back to the people that they spoke to. And it was incredible hearing from these guys about people were like, wow, the government really listened to us and I can see my voice on the paper and they've come back to tell me how it impacted like, and the change that has happened. And for these communities, it's the first time they've ever actually felt seen and heard by the government. And it was incredible. It was really, it was really moving to hear that from the partners for us. Um, Importantly as well, we heard that they'd be more likely to participate in future rounds of consultation with government. Um, to me, that speaks um, of the real power of the program in that it goes beyond any one engagement. Um, at DPAC, we've also been impacted by our work with the partners. Each of us that have worked with the partners have taken away a passion and a drive for doing consultation meaningfully and for sharing what we've learnt, not only with our peers, but with those senior to us. I think it's really exciting that there can be a chain reaction from conversations that these folks have at their kitchen tables with people with experiences of boy literacy to conversations that then ha happen at an executive level in meeting rooms at the Department of Premier and Cabinet. It's been a privilege to work together with all of you in this work and on a personal note, it's something I'm most proud of in my time at DPAC. Thank you. <laughs>
talk to women who are living in poverty and what those experiences are like, and then a few months later see the results on national television and to be able to see her voice elevated. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> to see her voice elevated to the federal level and making a difference for women facing economic inequality nationally is, you know, just, it's so powerful. So, um, thank you. I've got a few final, uh, no, I'm not wrapping up, we're doing Q&A. Sorry, the tears have got me on my <laughs> This is what it's like working with these folks. Yeah. Um, so we've got a mic runner. Um, this is the time for Q&A. So take Jeff's advice and Charlie's. Don't be afraid. Don't treat us like snowflakes. Give us your questions. You can ask that. So let us know. Who wants to go first? Yeah, there's a question down the front here. I'm so glad that you feel heard by the government, but a part of me wonders, as somebody who was uh, like answered some of the early task costs, I guess, inquiries, at what point do you reckon your voice reaches a wall where empathy doesn't reach past it, as Scott Morrison famously had a empathy consultant? <laughs> at what point do you kind of get frustrated at, like, how do you communicate past that? An empathy wall. I really, I love that, actually. Um, I'll open that up to people on the panel. Um, how do we get past, I suppose, in terms of, you know, people can only care so much and then the bureaucracy steps in and they hit a wall and that kind of stuff happens. How do you deal with your frustration of working in the advocacy space? Yeah. Um, I swear. We'll just I swear at the TV. Pass this around. I swear every time at the table. I don't just swear in person. I swear at the TV too. Okay. And that's where all this started. But um, to me, it just makes me push harder. Like I'm not going to back down. I've already been trodden on. Shit on. You know, there's I'm systematic. You know, policies. All your big words. I don't have big words. I've got universal words like shit. <laughs> so I get angry about. I'll get more passionate, and I'm. I just won't back down. I can't. You know, I can't help you understand. You're not going to understand either if you don't live it. So for those with silver spoons, they might not understand, but just hear us. Just, just, you don't have to do much apart from listen. Dara? Just pass up the little thing now as well. Since I've been involved, um, I've looked around and thought, what we're doing isn't uncommon anymore. <laughs> The whole idea of being empathetic and being compassionate and being understood and understanding, it's affecting everybody in society. And that's why we're here, because the empathy barrier doesn't exist any For us, it doesn't exist at all. And if it did, we'd demolish it. <laughs> we'd burn it down or, you know, bulldoze it down very quickly because we're not like that. We don't have walls of any form. Um, yeah, because we've been engaged for our voices and our hearts to be heard. That's why we've been engaged. So, yeah. And I think, I really think, I've, Jared's right, I've not seen an empathy wall or an empathy barrier in this work. Like, I've sat in meetings with Meg Webb down the front here and watched her tear up because what we're saying relates, this is in a different context, but relates to her family, right? And it comes from our hearts to hers. And I think there's something about the visceral truth and the visceral honesty of it that, that does break down that barrier. And if it doesn't work in one direction, we just come at it from another direction and keep going until until we get there. But generally, it, it the arrow shoots pretty straight. And in relation to Mr. Morrison, I believe he once said, "You've got to have a go to get a go." So <laughs> this is us having a go and watch us. <laughs> That's Jeff mentioned being in a position that had enough strength to be here and to be involved in the task cost program. I'm wondering if, as part of this program, 
people are starting to feel like the crisis that the system perpetuates is being understood. And if that is starting to be understood, if there's one thing that you would like policymakers to hear to address crisis when crisis is in full swing, rather than just waiting to hear from people who have moved through it. Um, I'm at a bit of a loss. You got anything? <laughs> what about this side, Charlie? You're a you're a policy man. You got some thoughts on this on this one? Can we pass that down? I love being able to put my boss on the spot. <laughs> I'm going to cheat a little bit and go back a question because I think it's um, the answer is relevant to both. <clears throat> Just thinking about the empathy gap, I mean, when Taskoff says an advocacy organisation um, does our planning around systems change, attitudes change, behaviour change, um, we'll look to try and understand who the decision maker is or what is the part of the system that needs changing and try and work out is it empathy that's going to change it here or is it data or as Paul Keating famously said, always back the horse called self-interest. So, um, you know, I don't know about um, the, probably the ethical standards of, of the community voice partners may, may not sort of stoop to that sort of engagement, but certainly at Tascos we recognise that sometimes it is self-interest that will drive decision makers. Um, sometimes it's the hard data, they don't care about the stories, sometimes the stories, not the data. And so Tamar, around your question, how, how do we respond to crisis or how do we get a, a crisis response? It is understanding a combination of all of those things. What are the levers we need to pull? Uh, what is it that's going to change that decision maker's mind in the moment in order to um, produce the you know, urgent response that's required? I have to say in the current cost of living crisis and we saw in the, in the um, most recent state budget, everything Tascos did was not enough. Um, and yeah, we're kind of regrouping to, to plan our next steps. Um, I reckon also around the question of crisis, we saw government do it with COVID, right? They cut all the red tape, they removed all the barriers. Um, you know, like one of my favourite things that a different John, different lived experience advocate from a fairer world says is like, in the right environment, I'm not disabled, right? So it's an example of ableist systems prevent excluding people. And when flexible work came into place, I became not disabled, right? Because I can work from home and it's an environment that I am much more functional and comfortable in. And so I guess my message from all of this is just just do it. Like we know we can, all the bureaucracy that gets in the way of change when COVID hit, we know that we can remove it and that it is possible. And I think that, you know, that notion of just cutting through the red tape when a crisis hits and doing the things that people on the ground say is necessary is the only response. Have we got another question? Yes. Francis? Yeah. Good to see you, Francis. Firstly, I think what you're doing is a brilliant idea and it's long overdue. To have an organisation that's actually taking the voices of the people that need the services is something that has been wanted for too long. And certainly my own lived experience is I worked hard all my life until I was injured and then uh, for various reasons started needing the system to look after me and what it did was create ever more problems. But I won't go into that. But, uh, what I want to know is, first of all, I'm, I would be interested in, in lending whatever assistance I can and, and my whole soul to this organisation. I think it's brilliant. Um, have you got plans at this stage to actually tackle those institutions that have become such a major problem? Centrally, the job centres, uh, even charities. Now, the amount of times that I got into a charity to ask for assistance, and it's about, oh, we can give you a $10 voucher to take to Woolies, or I mean, I remember giving a woman and her daughter $5, my last $5, 
so she could buy bread and milk. That's all she wanted. And mission, city mission, just said to her, we don't do that. We can give you canned goods. So what, what I'm trying to say is, there's a lot of services out there that always has been, but they seem to badly miss the mark. Is TASCOS going to be about getting those organisations on board? Are you going to hit them and say, if you say you're here to help, then firstly, the reason for you helping shouldn't be even important. It shouldn't be necessary. And listening to all those personal stories, we all have one. And of course, it does make you emotional. But let's face it, when you're saying, I need help, the first thing out of their mouth shouldn't be why. It should be, how can we help? What can we do to help? Or even, how much do you need to help? Quite often, it's about a small amount of money. And I bet every one of you that have gone through the system know that is never forthcoming. You know, they, they will offer anything but be you know, to say, if, if all you need is $10, there it is. And we're here when you need us again. So my question is, is that going to be a target for task force? That's a really great question. Um, and unfortunately, in a neoliberal capitalist society, the answer comes down to funding and money. Um, so. Audit, um, Jordan did a bit of a cheeky bid for funding earlier um, and we are currently looking for sustainable funding and I know that these guys, every one of them that I've talked to is like, we should do it here, we should roll it out across the nation, this should be for youth, for, you know, like they're, they're chomping at the bit to expand and so am I, but our capacity to do that is limited by the funding that we have and so what I would love to see is you know, a good amount of sustainable funding come in so that we can do that kind of um, front end loading and strategic planning to target organisations, go out and do one on one engagements with the CEOs or the executive team, say, here's what we have to offer, here's how we want to support your organisation, here's the resources, Here, here's how much it costs, and here's what you get. And that really kind of, um, like you're saying, like targeted and um, forefront engagement. At the moment, our model is that organisations come to us because that's the capacity that we have right now. Um, so I might throw to these guys and say, if... Well, the... If I could just add, mm. in, I would, I'm not really thinking about um, the money side. What I'm thinking about is, that, for instance, um, Centrelink is the government. It is run, it's owned by us, okay, publicly owned. Centrally needs to be able to tell people what their services are because they don't. They very purposely don't. And quite often, I mean, a lot of my policy came from using up money that I didn't need to, like not being told that if I took my super out, I didn't have to live on it so that when I reached old age, I have no nothing. You know, I mean, I live in a caravan and I'm quite comfortably off because I don't have high costs. But I, I worked really hard for a whole life to end up living in a caravan. And that's when I realised that the system is unfair. Incredibly unfair. But unless you can fix the system, then it's really just talking about it again, and is that going to be enough? Are you going to feel proud that you've done enough unless you can actually do something about the system? And make the government do something about Centrally. Make the government do something about <coughs> the job providers. John, can I, can I just jump in there? Because there is really um, important work being done there, and um, I completely agree with your need for long overdue, urgent overhaul of those systems. Robo-debt is only one um, in a litany, litany of disasters that have made um, people's lives miserable. So our, um, our counterpart, um, COS, ACOS, Australian Council of Social Services, is doing massive work every single day, getting people with lived experience up before policymakers, decision makers, politicians, 
talking about the urgency of that need. So rest assured, that is being done at a national systems level. Um, our humble but powerful program is more focused very locally. And yes, we are going to continue as far as the resources allow. And, you know, it's TASCOS's mission to challenge and change systems, attitudes and behaviours that create poverty and inequality. So we will continue to do that work every day. And, you know, we're very, yeah, we welcome the experiences of, of yourself as well as our partners and other people in the community to help direct us, focus our work, um, you know, in a more targeted way or more appropriately. But that is, that is work that is happening every day. It's slow, but it's happening. And I think the point is that we're changing individual hearts and minds, right? So it is slow, but it is what create, as Grace Tame says, it is what informs social and structural change, right? Um, and yes, if we had a bigger platform, maybe that would change the level that we can reach. But at the moment, the influence we're having for communities and individuals is incredibly powerful. But even getting your I information... Might, sorry, uh, sorry, Francis, sorry. I might just... Um, we can have a chat afterwards and maybe you can have a chat with some of the other partners. I just want to see if there's other questions. We've got time for one more. Up the back, yes, Alex. Um, I appreciate the really big questions that have been asked, but if I may delve into minutia, um, I was just interested listening to you, Mel, talking about you know um, your daughter at school and the resume building, and then Lucy, your point around kind of reimagining what professionalism is in the context of the work that's been done. I just wondered, is are there what are some of the secondary or kind of flow-on things that have arisen for both? sides of the fence, both the participants and the facilitators, in terms of this work that's in addition to the direct benefit of being put into policy. Um, yeah, so what are the kind of extra things that you've learned? Um, I think for me, mainly, like, giving my children the ability to use their voice and then them making the changes, like, at school. And being able to advocate for them. My son's only 10 and the stigma associated with his dyslexia, he already carries. He already feels stupid and dumb and struggles because he's behind everybody else in his class. So for him at 10, to, for me to be able to get inside his head and preach to him how important it is to advocate for him, because I'm not always going to be there. So he's going to be an adult at some stage too. So the sooner he can nip this stigma in the butt, and speak up for himself and just say, look, I'm not doing that plan, that's it. I'm not doing it. I'll do the numeracy part, but I'm not doing the literacy. That, that's a big win in my book, like, and that's rippling down, like, my, my teenagers doing it. I've got seven-year-olds that have been involved in the program as well for a children's book, so they're giving feedback on a children's book, and who better to give feedback on a kid's book than a kid? So, they rewrote like, multiple pages. Yeah, so they're, like... They're watching me and it's rubbing off on them so they don't feel like they don't have a voice like I have. So it's, and I'm creating a new generation. So. <laughs>
Um, I'd like to invite our other four community voice partners who are not on the stage with me to please stand up. <laughs> We have Sajini, who, like Kerry, has been with us from the start and contributed hugely to um, co-designing the program as it is now. We've got Rosie and Sam and Liana. Um, I'd encourage you to take Alex's question and use that as a conversation starter to get to know these guys. Like, what have they learned? What have been the ripple effects for them and the communities and the organisations that they've worked with? And hear more about their lived experiences. Um, so... A few final notes to wrap up before I set you loose on the cheese platters. First, a huge thank you to our panellists and to my co-host, Kerry, for doing such an amazing job tonight. I know there was a lot of nerves around, myself included, but I actually think we killed it. <laughs> um, and there is... We've got Aurora up the front. So as one of our sponsors, they've got a table here to share information about their advanced meters, the Aurora Plus digital platform, and the Your Energy Support program that Jordan talked about before. So if you'd like to find out more, go and chat to Jenna or Leroy. Um, and then all our Web community voice partners will be mingling, and they're also at a table where Lucinda is sitting. Lucinda, can you wave over there? There'll be a couple stationed there so that you can go up and there's pamphlets and information about the program. You can have a chat, learn more about it, find out about them. Um, and so stick around, do some networking, have a drink, have some cheese, and um, yeah, come and come and talk to us. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>